Hello and welcome everyone to the Varsity Tutors Wildlife Creature Club series where we are so excited to learn all about raptors with our friends at the World Center for Birds of Prey. We're joined today by Director of the Peregrine Fund's World Center for Birds of Prey, Tate Mason, and Peregrine Fund Education Coordinator, Curtis Evans, who are going to be sharing some fascinating facts about these predators and we'll even get the opportunity for a few close-up encounters. Now, before I hand it off to Tate to get us started, I wanna make sure we're prepared to be as collaborative and as interactive as possible in this live class. So here are just a few quick things to note. Now, I'm not sure if I could say the same for the raptor friends we'll be meeting today, but Tate and Curtis don't bite. So as we move through the lesson, feel free to use the chat panel on the right-hand side of your screen to ask the team any questions that you have for them throughout the lesson and to answer the questions they'll have for you. And if we don't get to your question in real time, we'll have about 10 minutes at the close of the lesson specifically set aside for Q&A with the team. You'll also wanna make sure that you have your cameras handy because toward the end of the lesson, you'll have the opportunity to lean into the screen and pose for a selfie with one of the Raptor friends we'll be meeting today. And if you tag us at Varsity Tutors and the Peregrine Fun on Instagram, you'll have the opportunity to win a bird watching guide as well as a Wildlife Creature Club membership. Now we're gonna talk more about the prize and the specifics on how to enter toward the end of class. But in the meantime, I'm gonna go ahead and hand it off to Director of the World Center for Birds of Prey, Tate Mason. Hello everybody. I'm so happy to be here today. So excited for this program. Of course, Birds of Prey are my favorite creatures on planet Earth. And uh, I think that bringing people to this world of raptors is just one of, one of the great joys of my life. So we are gonna get that going right now. And I think that this needs to go into that. You should be seeing my slide there. The Peregrine Fund is a conservation organization that's been around for over 50 years. And we have been saving species around the world, um, saving species from extinction. That's our mission, the conservation of birds of prey worldwide. But let's start, let's back up a little bit. I wanna ask you a question. Which animal power of any, I was kind of thinking of any animal that you could possibly be, but I'm gonna give you three choices to kind of increase the, uh, the interaction here. So which animal power would you like to have? The ability to swim like a dolphin? That's A. The ability to hear like a dog. Dogs have excellent hearing. Or the ability to fly like a bird. Now I'll give you guys a second. Go ahead and put A, B, or C. Oh, I, there's a lot of dolphin lovers in this group. But as I suspected, far and away, people are interested in flying. And humans have been interested in flying forever. It's one of the most uh, inspiring things, the feeling of freedom, of, of feeling the air through your wings. The fastest creatures on earth are birds. The most maneuverable creatures in the sky. Here's an American kestrel, the smallest falcon in North America. And um, here's a California condor soaring overhead. Uh, you know, the ability to soar up thousands of feet above the valley floor to be able to see everything around. And just imagine the feeling that that condor has right now. Now I got into birds of prey by studying owls and owls are not really known for their speed or their maneuverability or their aerobatics or anything like that. This is the owl I studied for my graduate degree, the Northern Sawwet Owl. And now here at the World Center for Birds of Prey, we have a bunch of owls that we work with. Uh, this one here is called a Eurasian Eagle Owl. Now, owls, they're not fast, they're not aerodynamic, but they are raptors, right? And so I showed you a, a kestrel, I showed you a condor, which is a vulture, and here's an owl. These birds are very different from each other, right? So what's going on here? What is a bird of prey? And I kind of like to start a lot of lessons there. It's a predatory bird with three common traits, three adaptations. And if you remember, an adaptation is a characteristic that helps an animal survive. So these traits are kind of how birds of prey survive. Now, birds of prey have curved beaks. They have excellent eyesight, forward-facing eyes. 
and they have sharp talons and those talons are used to capture their prey. So birds of prey are capturing their prey with their feet. Now that predatory, that word really means that they are, um, they're eating other animals, they're predators. They're carnivores. Maybe you're familiar with that word carnivore, but keep in mind that there's a lot of birds that are carnivores that are not birds of prey. Think about pelicans, think about penguins. These are fish eating birds, but eagles are fish eating birds with these three characteristics, the curved beak, excellent eyesight, and they capture their prey with their feet. Now, another word for bird of prey is raptor. Um, so discovering raptors is the name of this course. It could be discovering birds of prey. I think of those two words as synonyms. They mean the same thing. And there's over 580 different types of birds of prey around the world. Really, really fascinating creatures. All right, time for another quiz. Raptor, not a raptor. Based on the information that I've given you, a will be a raptor, B not raptor. What do we think? I believe that's an ostrich there. And ostriches are fast, they run really fast, but that's not one of the things that makes a raptor. Remember, owls are slow. Um, this is not a raptor, of course, that's an ostrich. How about this one? That bird's called a northern harrier. And this is how you might see raptors a lot, soaring up overhead. Um, and you, you can see that bird's hook beak, forward facing eyes. Um, you can't really see the talons on it, but this bird here, yep, yeah, that's a raptor. Ah, here we have another beautiful, beautiful duck from North America. This is called a wood duck. Hmm, not a raptor, You're all, you are right on that one. Now I've, I've uh, worked with birds for a long time and this bird bites really hard. One of the birds that I really do not want to bite me. I've been bit by a lot of Northern Cardinals uh, in the research that I've done with birds. They kind of bite like a raptor, but they don't have a hooked beak, do they? No, and their eyes kind of out on the sides of their heads, um, very weak, weak feet. They're not capturing prey with their feet. This is a seed eater. You can learn a lot about a bird by studying its beak. And this bird is not a raptor, correct. All right, here's a tough one for you. Raptor or not a raptor? Look at that beautiful, that is a curved beak. And you can't really tell how good the bird's eyesight is by looking at it, right? Now this is a toucan and toucans are not predatory birds. They are birds that eat seeds. And so these birds are not raptors. Um, although I see a number of you pick, picked raptor, but that, that's just fine. These birds are toucans. I spent a lot of time with toucans too, and they're so, so cool. Um, here's a bird that I have never seen before. Um, this is a bird from Africa. And this is called a secretary bird. And secretary birds are a very peculiar type of bird of prey. This is a raptor, yep. All right. Thanks for playing that game with me, everybody. Now, raptors as symbols. We see raptors all around us in popular culture, right? Uh, I wanna throw up my favorite football team. I don't know if any of you all are from the Seattle area, but that's a Seahawk. There's no real bird called a Seahawk, but there's the symbol. Uh, what's this one? The, the uh, falcon symbol from the Atlanta Falcons. I like this symbol because they got the eyes, the beak, and the talons all in the same symbol. That's great. Uh, the Philadelphia Eagles. So there's another uh, bird of prey symbol waiting for an expansion team called the Vultures. Um, maybe I'll be waiting for a while. Where else do we see raptors in our everyday life? Well, there's the, the scouting emblem. Be prepared. That's an eagle on there. Very similar eagle to the presidential seal of the United States. Look at that eagle on there. An eagle is, of course, the national symbol of the United States. The Postal Service. Next time you see the mail truck rolling by your house, look out there and see if you can see a bird of prey on it. And uh, you, might, you might see that there's an eagle there. 
So these three birds are, are bald eagles. And there's two bald eagles here. Now, when, I'm, when I am learning about birds, one of the first things I try to do is identify them. And bald eagles are one of the more identifiable birds of prey or birds in general in North America. And so as I'm learning new birds, I like to start with a reference point. So with birds of prey, why don't we start with bald eagle being a reference point? Most people probably recognize it already. If you don't, here it is. It's got a white head. It's got um, white on its tail as well. And there's bald eagles. Here's a bald eagle that you might see overhead. Now keep in mind that they only get their white head after about four or almost five years of age. So juvenile birds, young birds, can be a little bit more difficult to identify. But this bird has a six foot wingspan. So that's, that's a pretty amazing wingspan for a bird. Typically when you look up and you see a bald eagle, it makes an impression on you. How many have seen bald eagles? Have you all seen a bald eagle before? Let's put it in the comments, yes or no. And where did you see it? Give you a second to, to add on to that. How many of you all have seen a bald eagle? Now, there are two types of eagles in North America. There is the bald eagle and there is the golden eagle. Now the golden eagle is a bird that's typically found in more open landscapes, oftentimes away from water. So the bald eagle is a fish specialist, a sea eagle um, found near rivers, lakes, and oceans. Whereas the golden eagle is typically found more in dry, open landscapes like here around Boise, Idaho, where I'm at. Now, I'd really like to introduce you to a golden eagle. Golden, um, my friend Curtis Evans is a raptor specialist with the World Center for Birds of Prey. He is one of the most knowledgeable eagle wranglers that you'll ever meet. And so uh, I'm going to hand it over to Curtis, and he's with a bird named Marshall. Oh, we, we just saw Marshall get really comfortable. Um, he missed his cue. He was just fluffing up his feathers, getting ready for camera, and he looks gorgeous, doesn't he? I'm gonna step out of this for a second because I want you guys to meet Marshall up close and personal. He is a boy and he, believe it or not, is a small golden eagle. Um, he, he weighs in at about four and a half up, well, five pounds some days. And uh, he uh, um, is smaller than the girls, um, but don't, don't let his smallness fool you. He is still a very dominating and powerful eagle um, as they are known to be. And if we take a look at their feet, we can obviously see that this is gonna fall into side of Tate's category of raptor. If you look at these toenails, they are large and curved and powerful. And his toes alone, the yellow part of his toes are quite thick and powerful as well. And he will be capturing his food in his feet. And so if you want to get to know a bird and what they will be doing with their time, you can look at their feet and get a pretty good idea. This guy is going to be grabbing animals off the ground. Lots of rabbits, also snakes and lizards, but as an eagle, he's also going to be up high soaring, and he will come down and capture other birds as well. And so as this um, bird that hunts from up high on those thermals soaring around, um, he also has those great eyes that allow him to look at the same thing with both eyes. He has binocular vision, just like you and I do. But most other birds that you might see are looking sideways, where this bird is always looking forward. He can turn his head around to get a good look around him. But when he looks forward, let's see if he'll look straight at, down at that camera at you guys. He's looking at you with both eyes. And he's looking down up as a soaring bird looking for his food beneath him. Um, obviously, he's got that great big curved, powerful beak for tearing up his food. And I want to see if he'll have a little snack for you guys. There you go. Whew, gone. <laughs> These guys don't mess around when it's time to eat. Um, th this Marshall here is just one of the most fantastic raptors. Oh, you want some more? All right, let's have some more. As an eagle, as one of two of North America's eagles, um, 
this is one of the most fantastic birds you're gonna find. When you do see them, their, their golden heads are gonna stick out um, and that just beautiful dark, dark brown body. Um, so if you're ever looking for a bird up in the sky and you think it might be an eagle, this is definitely one of the most amazing things you're gonna see. Uh, they dominate their, their food chain, they're at the top, both uh, when you write it down on paper, you're gonna see them at the top of the food chain, but when you look around outside, you're gonna see them right up top, right above everybody else, and they'll come screaming down out of the sky, feet first, ready for dinner. Look at those guys. Yeah. Ooh, they also slobber. <laughs> All right, Tate, do you want to take it from there? I could certainly yeah, spend the rest of our time with Marshall here, but. Uh... Thanks so much, Curtis. <laughs> yeah. Appreciate it. Um, and thanks to Marshall. Nothing like getting slobbered on by a golden eagle. It must be one of the greatest experiences. Best um, day of my life. Now, but why are, why are birds of prey important anyway? Um, and why is there an organization that studies them? Uh, Birds of prey are on top of the food chain. Curtis mentioned the food chain there. So we got a, the food chain in nature is really just who eats who or what out there. And everything's eating something in some way in order to get energy. And so here's, the, here's a, like a very simplistic version of a food chain with the grasses and the flowers and the insects would be there. And, you know, the mice and the rabbits eating the, the, the herbs and the, or the, the different vegetation and then snakes and hawks eating those, uh, you know, those kind of middle level um, animals. Now, if birds of prey are excellent indicators of the health of the environment, the health of the ecosystem, or really you could say the health of the food chain. So if there is a poison that is introduced to the environment somewhere in the food chain, which is something that happens quite a lot on planet Earth, poisons introduced, birds of prey are often affected by that. Things that are high on the food chain are oftentimes affected by poisons that are introduced much lower. So if you have a healthy population of birds of prey, then you can infer that you have a healthy ecosystem. If there are birds of prey that are endangered or are disappearing, oftentimes we can do a little bit of research and figure out what's going wrong and how can we make the ecosystem the healthier place. Now back in 1950s, 1960s, there was a chemical that was used called DDT. And DDT was very popular in the war on bugs. Now the war on bugs was basically, let's spray everything and kill all the insects. You know, creepy crawlies, crop damage, um, trees are, you know, can, can be infested with different bugs. Um, and there was really a mentality that came out where, well, let, let's go ahead and, and, and end a lot of these bugs and these problems. And so DDT was an insecticide that was developed and deployed worldwide. And it seemed like it was safe, um, maybe without looking at birds of prey populations, but raptors started disappearing all around the world. Um, and some of them became endangered and, and really, like the bald eagle became endangered, the peregrine falcon became endangered. These things were disappearing and people didn't know why. And so we used science in order to determine what the issue was. And the peregrine falcon in particular in 1970 was listed as an endangered species. It was down to about 40 pairs in the continental United States it was gone east of the Mississippi River by, by about 1970, 1975. And we were looking at losing the fastest creature on planet Earth, the peregrine falcon. Now, what does endangered mean? I think maybe I take it for granted that a lot of you understand what endangered is, but that's not really a given. Endangered is a, an official designation 
That means that if something doesn't change, the species will go extinct. And um, so what is extinct? Does that just mean that they're gonna start stinking? Um, no. Extinct means there's no more of a certain type of animal on planet Earth. Some of y'all might think of um, dinosaurs as extinct, but can you think of any, what I would say, modern day species that are extinct? Anything that has been around when, you know, more recently than say dinosaurs. Um, the ivory-billed woodpecker. Has anybody he ever heard of North America's largest um, woodpecker? It went extinct in 1944. There was some thought within the last 10 years that it was rediscovered in the, in the bottomland swamps of Arkansas, but nobody was ever able to find it. it and, and this bird is very likely to be extinct. Um, I never had a chance to see it, and, and that, that makes me pretty sad. The Carolina parakeet, I'm sure a lot of you are maybe from the Carolinas, southeast. Um, there, there used to be a parakeet native to Appalachia, and that's the Carolina parakeet, extinct in the 1930s. And then there's the, North, the, the most common bird in North America in the 1800s, in the 1700s, would have been the passenger pigeon. This was a pigeon that they flew in giant flocks and they darkened the sky, obscured the sun. There were so many of them. And amazingly, they went extinct um, just over a hundred years ago. So there are people alive now that were alive when all of these birds were around. And um, unfortunately they went extinct. But that is not the route of the peregrine falcon. And in fact, numerous other birds have been saved since we've been able to really legally delineate some species as endangered, right? And then therefore we're kind of obligated to save them. Now I wanna introduce you to a peregrine falcon and we're gonna swing back over to Curtis and, uh, and meet a bird named Star. Right. Yes, yeah, so this here is my friend Star, and she is a peregrine falcon. She is one of the most beautiful, most sleek, most aerodynamic, fastest birds on the planet. And she um, is an was an endangered species. That was one of the most amazing things for me as a growing up. I've always been interested in animals and birds and wildlife. And when I was younger, I knew that peregrines and bald eagles were an endangered species. And it wasn't until I was older that I realized other people had saved the species. And I'm so glad they did because it's such a beautiful bird. Um, one, I get to work with her in person, but I've also seen them in the wild. And so I'm gonna see if I can get this beautiful bird up here to meet you guys. Again, forward facing eyes. Um, just a striking bird. She's got the long toes. In fact, I think her toes are longer than the golden eagles. But if you can tell from this shot, they're also skinnier. And so she does not have that great, powerful grip strength that those eagles have. Instead, she's a falcon. And she is ready to grab other birds out of the sky. So her small and skinny toes allow her to get into those feathers and grab her food and then those toenails then sink in and she has her food, she has a meal and she really enjoys other birds. Um, there's not another bird that's in her area that she's not gonna wanna try to grab and eat. And she's, she's working on some quail right here. She's gonna use that curved beak perhaps to get a, a bite-sized piece. I thought I gave her a bite-sized piece, but she disagrees. She's gonna go ahead and tear it up a little bit for you and uh, see if she can get that down. Whoa, what a mouthful. Oh, you're gonna make it? <laughs> she might try again. So they don't chew their food. Their, their body chews their food for them inside their throat. They've got a place where they can, their body chews and grinds and uh, emulsifies that food down into something they can digest. And so 
she's going to do a little bit of work just making it smaller. And then once it goes inside her throat, it just sits in that crop area. And then her gizzard will chew it up for her. Oh, what a cool bird. She likes that food. I want to show you up close as the fastest animal on the planet. She's got to have a few tricks up her sleeve so that she is a successful hunter. Now, if you look in her nose, if, see if she'll look up at you guys and show you her nose, there's going to be a little bump on the inside of her nostril. I'm not sure if you're picking up on that there, girl, but we'll, that helps her breathe. If she is flying at 100 or over 100 miles an hour, they can hunt typically at 160. We've recorded them at over 240 miles per hour. If they're moving through the air that fast, that means the air is hitting them at the same speed. And if that air goes into her nose and into her lungs at 160 miles an hour, I could imagine that would be uncomfortable but she can't hold her breath or she won't win the race as she's chasing down her food. And so that bump in her nose, we think that is there to help slow the air down so that when it hits her face and goes into her lungs, it's a comfortable speed that she can breathe that air. And so she can keep working and keep racing and diving and chasing her food. Another amazing feature that our, our, we see on all falcons is we see this dark stripe down her cheek. And in fact, her whole head is dark. But if you see another falcon, you're gonna see there's always a bit of dark under her cheek. And that allows her to be more successful at catching her food up in the sky. As her food might dart and twist and turn in the air, she's gonna follow with it. And if that bird gets up in the sunlight and the sun hits her cheek, it's gonna get absorbed by the blackness instead of reflecting into her eye. And so she, is just built for speed. She's built for capturing birds in the air, um, just dominating it again, and just another top uh, predator in that food chain. Um, yeah, let's see. Just such a magnificent, noble creature. Yeah. So her story, right, this recovery, um, people were watching these birds for hundreds, maybe even thousands of years, we've been watching and recording our encounters with birds. And when we realized this bird was in trouble, people reacted quickly and powerfully. They decided that this bird was too important to us. Um, personally, as a culture, uh, we wanted to keep these birds around because they, they just represent so much of what we value. Um, their loyalty, their integrity, their noble, um, they, just amazing predators, fearless, amazing parents. And uh, like I said, fastest animal on the planet. You can't pass up on that. Let's take one more look. Yeah. Just a great girl. I say, if she's holding real still, now might not be a bad time to get a picture of this, of this girl. She'll look back at the camera with you guys. <laughs> awesome. Well, we will stick around for our Q&A at the end. So if, um, if there's any questions that are, we need to answer right now, I'd be happy to, but we, we'll gather some of those questions as well. And uh, we'll chat more about STAR here at the end if you have any questions for us. So um, Sounds great. Sounds great, Curtis. We will um, look forward to that Q&A uh, because there is a lot of interesting questions that will come out of this class, I'm sure. So the peregrine falcon, no longer an endangered species. Uh, the species is considered recovered. And um, the, the organization that Curtis and I work for is called the Peregrine Fund. Uh, the Peregrine Fund was founded by falconers. Now falconers are people that hunt with trained birds of prey. Falconry isn't only conducted with falcons. You could be a falconer with an eagle, or you could be falconer with a hawk, or maybe an owl, and you could go out and hunt mice with the owl at night. I'm not sure if anyone really does that. Uh, but falconry is a, is a very deep and historic, I say sport, but it's more like an art, and it's very much of a lifestyle. Um, and the people that have practiced falconry 
over the ages, probably over 4,000 years, people have been practicing falconry and they are so committed to these birds and they have such insider knowledge from living and hunting and working with these birds that falconers were really the ones that were best positioned to save birds of prey. And how did they do that? By raising little baby birds. Um, and the Peregrine Fund and the falconers that really all came together in the 1960s and 1970s in order to save the peregrine, um, they developed the techniques of how to get these birds to make more of themselves in captivity. And then typically what would happen is these baby birds, these young birds would be released out into the wild. Maybe you've read, read a book called My Side of the Mountain. A lot of people get into falconry because they read that book. And it, you know, it's a book that there, you know, there's a kid that is living on his own in the wild and he trains a peregrine falcon. And uh, the, the falcon becomes not only his companion, but his hunting partner. And that's really what falconry is all about. It is, you know, it, it historically has been a way for people to feed themselves long before people could go out and maybe shoot a duck with a shotgun in order to feed their family and eat that duck, people figured out that they could, that the falcon could catch the duck. So um, that, that is a, a hunting sport, falconry. And the Peregrine Fund came from falconers. And it's just a great example of sportsmen and women, people that are hunting, acting for conservation the saving of species. And the peregrine falcon, uh, delisted in 1999, restored, taken off the endangered species list. You know, that is one of the most successful conservation stories of all time. Keep in mind, the peregrine falcon is found on every continent around the world. It's found on every continent except for Antarctica. So uh, for the, the world to all come together and save a species that's found all over the world. Uh, just a really inspiring, really inspiring story. And the neat thing is that it worked. And so here's a peregrine falcon on a downtown city ledge. And you may have heard that falcons live in cities. And, and I would imagine that a lot of people in this lesson today are living in a city and there probably are falcons in your area. Now, peregrines, they need a nest, I mean, a ledge in order to nest on. And they don't need a ledge much bigger than the one you see in this picture here. Um, historically, through time, falcons nest on cliffs, peregrine falcons in particular. They're cliff nesting birds. And so think of a city skyscraper as a cliff. Now, what do falcons need besides a place to nest for their habitat? They need prey. Are there any birds in cities? Yes, there are a lot of birds. Um, there's pigeons, there's starlings, there's sparrows, uh, and, and more. And so the falcon's got a ready availability of food, and it's got nesting uh, platforms. So cities are great habitats for birds. And to me, there's a lesson there. Birds live close to people. And when we think about saving birds from extinction, it's so inspiring to me that birds will live close to people and people are not the problem. People are not the problem. Oftentimes our behavior can be the problem. Something like po putting poison out into the environment. Typically not everybody's putting poison into the environment. There's maybe just a few people that are doing it. Can we, can we figure out a better way to do things. Humanity is always finding better ways to do things. And by studying birds of prey, they're really giving us hints about how we can keep our environment healthier. Also keep in mind that birds of prey are on top of the food chain, but who else is on top of the food chain? Humans, humans are on top of the food chain. So by keeping the landscape healthier for birds of prey, we are also keeping the landscape healthier for humans.
All right, we talked a lot about Falcons. What about Hawks? We haven't talked much about Hawks. Um, and we are gonna focus on Hawks in our next, uh, our next episode of Discovering Raptors. But this one here is a sharp-shinned hawk. And I wanted to bring this one um, to your attention in particular because this is a species that a lot of us will find in our yards, especially if you live kind of outside of a city, maybe in a little bit more of a suburban area, and especially if you have bird feeders in your yard, because bird feeders, they attract little birds, um, juncos and, and sparrows and, um, and finches and that sort of thing. Now, the sharp shinned hawk and kind of its older brother, the Cooper's hawk, or it's, it's bigger brother, the Cooper's hawk, these birds hunt from bird feeders and they hunt those little birds. And so um, if you see a bird, a, a fast raptor, they think might be a raptor that's flying through your neighborhood. I see these all the time. You see them really quick and they're gone. That's oftentimes what happened. Or they'll perch just like this one on a fence in your backyard. People call us all the time at the World Center for Birds of Prey and they say, hey, I got a peregrine falcon in my backyard. And I say, well, look in your bird book and look up sharp-shinned hawk. Um, and oftentimes this is the bird they mean, a good big long tail like that. Um, and that, that striped tail is really pretty obvious on the Sharpie. I'm not gonna call him a Sharpie. Um, what's this bird? This is another bird of prey soaring up overhead and another type of bird that we're gonna delve more into next time. This one here is called a turkey vulture. A turkey vultures are, they're typically black. They're, they're basically always black. And, but you, when I look at them, I can really see the light color toward the back of their wings and the dark toward the front of their wings. They have that kind of bifurcated look where it's like dark in the front and light in the back. And the turkey vultures will, will oftentimes soar with this dihedral wing pattern where their, their wings are actually faced up almost like in a V as they're flying and, and teetering along out there. And turkey vultures are scavengers. They're, they're using their sense of smell and, and looking, looking for um, smelling out dead creatures and cleaning them up, cleaning up the environment, cleaning up the landscape. Um, turkey vultures are such awesome birds of prey. We also have black vultures and, and condors in North America to round out basically all the vultures in North America. We've already talked about all the eagles in North America. There's only two. But hawks are a little bit more complicated and we're gonna get into the hawks a little bit too during the next episode. I wanted to introduce one of the most common hawks across North America. This one's called, any guesses, any guesses? Um, take a look at the tail. That's not really red. It's more of orange or a rust colored, but that is a red-tailed hawk. Red-tailed hawks are found all across North America. One of the more common birds that we have that if you're paying attention, almost wherever you are, you can probably find a red-tailed hawk. Um, they're one of the more easy birds to identify with that red tail, but also want to point out the very front patch on their wing, just like right there in their elbow. They have a really dark patch in the front of their wing. And that's an identifying characteristic of a red-tailed hawk. So keep an eye out for red-tailed hawks when you're out there. It's one of the best things about birds of prey or just birds in general, just how close they live to humans. Now we are also going to introduce to you during our next episode, the uh, milky eagle owl. This is an African owl and just an incredible bird that we have here at the World Center for Birds of Prey, one of our colleagues. And I wanted to close this session with another kind of open question. What is it about birds of prey that are so fascinating? You know, Curtis talked about those forward facing eyes. They're very intelligent birds. They're great parents. The more that we understand about these birds, the more we understand about the world around us. And the more we understand about the world around us, the better decisions we can make for the conservation of our environment. So thank you all so much for attending this 
this uh, program, Discovering Raptors. Um, Curtis is still here with the Peregrine Falcon. I'm here to answer any questions as well. Let's welcome back Haley. Wow, thank you so much to Tate, to Curtis, to Marshall and Star, of course. Now, don't fly away just yet, everyone. It is time for that selfie. So once again, I know we've got Curtis who will be coming back up here with Star for us to go ahead and get that selfie. I'm sure you guys probably had plenty of photo opportunities earlier on as uh, those magnific magnificent birds were gazing into the camera for you. Uh, so I'll give you a moment to get your cameras at the ready, give Curtis a moment to, to hop on back here. But in the meantime, uh, just as a reminder, if you post those selfies on Instagram and you tag us here at Varsity Tutors and the Peregrine Fund, you will have the opportunity to win a bird watching guide from the World Center of Birds of Prey, as well as a membership to the Wildlife Creature Club, where you'll experience small group classes to learn more about all sorts of creatures, as well as various challenges in the Varsity Tutors Learning Lab. Now, I'll be sure to put those Instagram tags up on screen for you all at the end of class, but in the meantime, it looks like Star is ready for that selfie. So Star and Curtis, take it away. Oh, hi guys. Star here, she got a little bored and she wanted to start talking. We'll see if she has much more to say. <laughs> um, here she is. Yeah, please get, come on in and get a picture with Star. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pop out and let you guys take my spot. Maybe stick your hand up with my glove and you could, you could get a picture holding her maybe. I don't know if that works. I think it's pretty cool. Excellent. Well, I can, we can talk and uh, answer some of those questions. I just, I just got my selfie from the star there. So. Did you get yours? <laughs> That's <laughs> awesome. So, come and screenshot so I can get one. That's amazing. I'm sure we'll get plenty of those photos uh, uploaded to Instagram shortly. And of course, if you didn't get the chance just yet, uh, I'm sure Curtis will be here with Star. We'll be answering a couple of questions. So you're more than welcome to lean in the, at, uh, to the screen at any point and grab that photo. In the meantime, uh, we've had a couple of really, really wonderful photo uh, questions from students. And I'll go ahead and get things started because we had quite a few questions specifically about Marshall and Star. So questions like how, how much they weigh, what it is they were eating. I know you mentioned that a little bit uh, and how they came to be under your care. So Curtis, would you like to talk a little bit about uh, about Star and about Marshall. Certainly. So yeah, so they were both eating quail today. So we, we uh, get some quail from, from breeders that supply for zoos and different places that, that keep um, predators. We need to feed them and they do eat meat. So you saw them pulling apart and swallowing some quail and they, they go ahead and eat the whole thing. So they got the bones, they got the skin and the different organs from inside. Um, they eat the whole thing. So that's where they get their nutrition. Yeah. You want to tell them? You can tell them, but they don't know what you're saying. She likes it, I think. I think that's what she's telling me. She really enjoys our quail, but they also will get some other items as well. So sometimes they'll eat some mice. Uh, certainly the, the golden eagle, he'll eat some more mice and rabbits and chicken. Um, they, they're here with us because they are ambassadors for their species. And so our scientists and our biologists are all around the world right now. We have them in 30 different countries doing these projects. And every bird that we come across, we wish they could live in the wild, but some of them just can't. And so if they're going to be living with people, we want to make sure we can give them everything they need. And that includes Star, who... Um, she was raised by people and so she doesn't have the skills that she would have learned from her parents. And so she has us as her parents. And so we've given her the best job a human can have. And that is to talk to people about peregrine falcons. And so that's her new job. Um, if she was in the wild, she would have learned her job from her parents. And that goes for, She's doing a great job, don't you agree? <laughs> this, she's, that's her job. She's, her job is to talk to people about peregrines so that they can make good choices to help her brothers and sisters that are out in the wild. And that's true for our golden eagle. He cannot survive. He got sick and went to a rehabilitation center and they got the disease fixed, but he has lasting effects that just won't let him survive in the wild. And so that's why those two birds are here. Um, they, they have a job. They have some great food and they get to meet some wonderful friends that come and visit us. So, yeah. 
Wow. And then uh, a few very similar questions about raptors in general. Uh, can raptors eat prey that is as large as them, bigger than them? What's the largest prey that a raptor will eat? Now, I'm aware of some pretty wild saw wet owls. Tate, I don't know if you set you up for that or if you have a different answer. Well, the, the largest prey that a raptor can eat, I'm going to go ahead and say blue whale, uh, because I, I believe that is the biggest creature on planet Earth. And if a whale washes up on shore, you know who's going to eat it? The vultures. And so um, there, there you have it. Um, now, typically, they're birds of prey that are actually attacking something and killing it. And you're not going to have a bird of prey killing a blue whale. Um, but if typically uh, they can go after things that are bigger than them, but ideally they don't want to get hurt. So there's this always this kind of cost benefit analysis that goes through the brain of a bird of prey before it attacks something. And uh, if it could fight back, that's one thing. Harpy eagle, there's a harpy eagle behind me right there. Harpy eagles are known to eat howler monkeys. And howler monkeys are pretty big and aggressive monkeys of Central and South America. And so uh, that's one of the, the kind of more larger alive prey items that uh, like a bird, like a harpy eagle might, might attack. Was there another part of that question there? Sure. So yeah, to kind of add on to that, we know that these creatures are really adept hunters, that they have a very wide variety of prey. Other than what we've spoken about, uh, the potential human interaction, are there, any, are there any animals that these birds need to be wary of that hunt these, these particular birds? Yeah, I'll go ahead and jump in. They need to be wary of humans. Um, people have been shooting birds of prey as long as people have invented um, firearms. Um, it's interesting because over thousands of years, humans and birds of prey were partners in falconry and putting food on the table and working together. And when the shotgun was invented, a lot of people turned their sights on the raptors and that partnership for a lot of people kind of fell apart. And so persecution by humans is one of the biggest things. Habitat loss is the biggest threat to birds of prey around the world, especially if you also consider their food being part of their habitat. So if their food is poisoned, I consider that habitat loss because habitat is part of their, you know, food, water, shelter, space. That's what makes up habitat. And so, yeah, habitat's a big deal. But once you get into like actually other animals that could kill birds of prey, typically it's other birds of prey. So imagine a peregrine falcon is down on the ground and is eating a duck. It's pretty vulnerable at that point. Now imagine Marshall the golden eagle is flying overhead and looking down and saying, there's a duck and a falcon. I'll eat them both. I'm not particular and he'll fly in and, and, and will attack it. Typically the peregrine will get out of the way before that happens. Um, but other raptors, big owls are a threat to birds of prey, to smaller birds of prey in particular, but then bird, bigger hawks, you know, even like Cooper's hawks or goshawks, these hawks are gonna, going to hunt owls if the owls aren't very well hidden, you know, so at, in the nighttime, owls are in charge. And in the daytime, hawks, falcons, eagles are in charge. And, and the power dynamic kind of switches based on where we are in the, you know, in the daylight cycle. So there, there's some other thing, you know, like coyotes can, can uh, predate on nests and stuff like that. So there's, there's other, you know, kind of things that happen out there. It's a, it's a, it's a tough world out there for all animals. Wow, now this next question, we can probably go back over to Curtis for there with Star. And we had several students who were wondering, is it dangerous for you to be holding those birds? And do you have to be a professional to do so? Oh, fantastic, yes. So when you handle wildlife, you have to be respectful. Do you wanna tell them? She'd like to tell you. She's telling, you all that she's very dangerous. <laughs> we didn't cover that enough. They're, they're um, cute, but deadly. And so you do, I'm, I'm wearing some protection. I have um, a glove on. 
Yeah, yes, you're quite right. So um, you just have to be respectful and, um, and definitely trained. Um, these birds are on a permit. And so there's, there's legal ways to have these birds um, as a rehabilitator, as a falconer, as Tate mentioned, and as an educator. And so you definitely, if you're going to handle wildlife, you want to do that with someone who's trained and professional and then make sure you have the right equipment and understand what the risks are. You just have to respect them. I am in no danger right now. Um, I have a great relationship with Star. She has a relationship with me. If she was to get just a little bit nervous, she might squeeze my hand, but because I have the glove, I would just be able to understand that she's a little bit stressed. It wouldn't be a problem. I could then react and, and make sure she's comfortable. And so I, at this moment, I have, there's no danger for me. But if you were to go ahead and just start working with raptors without any training or, or relationship with that bird, you could get, uh, they could draw blood. I don't think anyone would, would lose a limb or life, but uh, you, you could, you'd end up in the hospital perhaps just to get stitched up. Otherwise, um, these birds are super gentle and, um, and uh, they just work really well in these situations. So, yeah. That is wonderful. Now, I know you've both spoken a little bit about what we can probably safely assume are some of your favorite birds, some of your favorite raptors, but we had several students wanting to know if you have a favorite or maybe a favorite that you haven't mentioned or spoken about yet. Yeah, I'll go ahead and start that. Um, my favorite bird is the California condor, and we didn't talk too much about the condor, um, but that is North America's largest flying bird, almost a 10 foot wingspan. And the Peregrine Fund is really involved with the recovery of the condor. They were down to just 22 individual birds in the 1980s. They would have gone extinct, except for people stepped in and started raising them in captivity, just like I was you know, showing you those baby falcons. We are currently raising baby condors here. We've got 10 eggs here on site right now at the World Center for Birds of Prey. Uh, those birds will be hatching over the next month, more or next couple months, the more will be laid. And so California condor, iconic bird of Western North America. Um, and I'm very hopeful for its recovery. Curtis? Yeah, I would love to say peregrine falcon and condor, but man, what a good question. That's like asking someone favorite color. My goodness, I, there's so many good colors. There's so many good birds. I would have to say my favorite bird is the northern flicker. It's not a bird of prey. It's just a really beautifully painted looking uh, woodpecker. But if we're talking about birds of prey, I got to say it. Our American kestrels, are, they've stolen my heart, every one of them, whether they're in the wild or one of the birds that we work with here, they are just the most ferocious, cute little predator that just, they're amazing. But as an individual, Lucy, our turkey vulture, is my absolute favorite bird on the planet. Not species, but my individual favorite bird is Lucy, the turkey vulture that I get to work with and she's uh, super smart. She's thinking in ways that I've got to keep up. She's super cool. Um, so I got three. I'm going to stop there. <laughs> All right. That's wonderful. That's great. And I imagine it's a pretty tough question, given your line of work and your involvement with all of these beautiful birds. Uh, now, we did have a few students who are a little curious. We've got kind of a which came first, the chicken or the egg question, uh, who are familiar with the term raptor for a split, slightly different type of animal that's been extinct for a little while. So do you guys happen to know, is there a reason why both of them go by the same name? Do we have some similarities there? Do we know which term was applied first? Curtis, um, I know you've been, I think she's going, talking about dinosaurs and velociraptors in particular. Um, I know Curtis is, is a, has been doing a lot of research on that front. What's going on with the velociraptor and how are, how are they related to, I mean, to, to birds? Sure. So I don't know, the, the answer that I'm not sure about is which one got the name first. So raptor means to seize and to capture. And so we see that the birds of prey, raptors, they have the tools to do that on their feet, on their, on their hind legs, right? And when we see a velociraptor, we see the same type of tools, those hooked 
toenails on their and their feet on their arms, right? So they both can are described by the term raptor to seize. Now, coincidentally, we believe the evidence of looking at those fossils. We we see so many similarities between birds, all birds, whether it's a seed-eating bird or a penguin or a duck, all birds share the features that define a dinosaur. I remember watching one of these, these, um, these presentations with uh, some other professionals talking about dinos or not dinos. And the way to decide if an animal is a dinosaur, it's hard to tell if a bird is not a dinosaur because they share all the features of a dinosaur. And we see in the fossil record that some of those dinosaurs had feathers. And so that's just another little bit of evidence that shows us that these birds have been raptors before they were birds. We believe that they were part of that theropod predatory group of dinosaurs. And the small flighted ones were able to survive when the large dinosaurs did not. So that's kind of, that's how I'd wrap it up if there's a follow-up yeah, question. In other words, understand. birds are dinosaurs. Is that what you're saying, Curtis? Uh, it's hard to tell the difference. It's hard, hard to, to tell the difference. I like that. That is great. So it looks like that root word has a little something to do with it. Now, I know we're starting to run a little lower on time. We had several wonderful questions about owls and about hawks. And I think we're going to save some of those for when we regroup for part two of this series. Uh, but for the time being, I would love to close things out with just one final question. And that is just how can students get involved? How can they get involved with the Peregrine Fund? How can they get involved with conservation? Do you have any closing thoughts for our students? So the first thing I do, go outside and look up, pay attention. The, the foundation of science is people paying attention, making observations. And so if you can go out and do that, that's, what I, that's the first step. And then question what you see. Um, do I recognize that or not? And the more that you understand, the better position that we will all be to be able to conserve uh, various animals that might be endangered or extinct. Now, a resource that you can use is our website, peregrinefund.org. And you can, I'm sure there's a link to it somewhere. Um, from there, we have a, um, a page called Explore Raptors. And there are a whole bunch of um, links to different birds of prey. I mean, the internet is pretty helpful, but, our, but we put a lot of effort into our website as an educational resource. If you're in Boise, Idaho, you can come to the World Center for Birds of Prey. Uh, but in lots of communities, there are raptor centers or even zoos where you can learn, uh, you can learn a lot about these wildlife and, and see them up close and that sort of thing. That is great. Well, thank you so much for your time, Tate, Curtis, uh, Star, Marshall as well. We are so excited to get uh, the opportunity to have some up-close encounters there. So on behalf of Varsity Tutors and all of the students out there uh, viewing and getting to meet these majestic birds, thank you so much for joining us. And thank you to all of you tuning in live for your thoughtful questions, uh, for interacting in the chat. We are so excited to see those Instagram posts. And if this class left you ready to sink your talons into even more learning about raptors like the ones you met today. We hope to see you guys back for the second series of the class on April 21st and in one of the many other classes in our Wildlife Creature Club series soon. So Tate, Curtis, of course, Marshall and, and Star, thank you so much. And in the meantime, everyone viewing, don't forget to post those selfies and tag us at Varsity Tutors and the Peregrine Fund to win. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Haley. See ya. Thank you.